Welcome to the Conference Center. Please be prepared to provide the confirmation number or host and company of the conference you wish to attend. Please stand by and an operator will be with you shortly. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon to discuss the 30-player preliminary roster for the 2014 FIFA World Cup. At this point, I'd like to introduce the head coach of the U.S. men's national team, Jurgen Klinsmann. Your thoughts on the 30-player preliminary roster. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the call. And uh, obviously, it's getting now more and more exciting. And with naming today the 30-man roster, we do another big step towards uh, the World Cup. And uh, the clock is ticking. They know that now is a moment where they have to prove that they're up to the task. We are obviously excited about the 30-man list. We can see them every day. We can see them compete with each other. And then it is down to, is he able to go through two months of stress, of suffering, of sacrificing himself? It's about being able to be a, a real team player, being able to put yourself into service for a bigger cause. Something that is far, far bigger than, than you as, a, as an individual. Nobody is here for the experience of it. Everybody is here for getting into the 23-man roster. Inside, U.S. Soccer's March to Brazil is presented by El Himador. Jurgen Klinsmann has invited 30 players to World Cup training camp. Only 23 can be on the final roster that goes to Brazil. Camp begins with something called the beep test, a collective rite of passage designed to simulate the effects of 90 minutes of all-out football in one 15-minute ordeal that ends only when the players can go no further. Our players, especially American-based players, you know, they just started their season in March. They don't have the amount of games in their legs, so the stamina is not built to the highest level yet. From now on, beginning of the World Cup preparation camp and the, the first game against Ghana, we have to jump probably, I don't know if it's now one or two or three levels, but I think we have to jump a few levels in the way we can stay focused and keep the stamina throughout 90 minutes, we definitely have to go two, three levels above what they are right now. We're trying to get as fit as possible. Um, and it's gonna be a World Cup where now teams that are prepared for that and teams are, that are ready to suffer um, are gonna do well. And so we wanna be the team that can suffer the most. Once you hear one beep, the first beep, go to the, the second line, and you have to make it there before the second beep. Once you hear the second beep, turn around, go back to the starting line, and make it before you hear the third beep. You know, you, you start off nice and easy, and, and you hear the beep, and you think you're running really fast, but really it's the distance. It's like 3,000 meters or something like that. And the pace gradually increases. Each level, you know, goes uh, faster and faster. It's the slow burn of the legs that just really gets you, and the legs go first. Your legs are throbbing, they're aching. You, just, you feel like your legs are like linguine. You can't even walk anymore. And... The legs start to wobble, and uh, your, your form goes, and everything else follows. I feel it in my throat, I can't really swallow, you get, it's really dry. And it comes a point where you just like hit a wall. Your lungs are burning. The lungs get tight, the mouth gets dry. Or you want to swallow, but you can't. And then your mind starts to think, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. You go until absolute exhaustion and uh, until you absolutely hit the wall. And then at a certain point, your body just says, absolutely not, no more. And then uh, you crumble.
it's not just preseason. This is fitness for another reason. So maybe that pushes you an extra two, three beeps. So I'm thinking, like, do this for Brazil, do this for my family. Like that's what these kind of thoughts you go in your head. You just want to push yourself. I mean, you can try to use your teammates as motivation. You know, when you start to feel tired, you're like, you know what, I got to do one more. I'm, I'm, you start stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about the team. I'm not doing this run for myself. I'm doing this run because it's going to help the team out. While his teammates have begun camp, goalkeeper Tim Howard is still in England, where he has spent the last 12 seasons in the Premier League, the longest and most successful run of any current American player in Europe. Everton's my club. That's the club that I love, that I'll always love. Um, you know, that, that Everton Football Club means everything to me there. It's my heart and soul, and, and to be able to uh, be an Evertonian, to be loved by the fans and, and give them that love back, it's brilliant. And if they're singing, if they're singing USA, then that means I've done something good, so that, that works as well. I started playing when I was six years old, so my earliest memories were always about scoring goals or winning games, you know? And I wasn't always a goalkeeper, so scoring goals was part of my repertoire, but from a very, very early age, I was, I was focused on soccer. I'm not a monster now, but I was, I was a big kid. I was tall. I was really, really tall and lanky for my age, so the tallest kid always goes in goal. And um, a few coaches made side deals with me when I was growing up. That if I played a, a half in goal, I could play out on, you know, a striker or something. So I was fighting goal, and I started to enjoy it, you know? And s for some reason, I, I, I love diving around. I love saving the ball. It was fun to me. So I ended up just, you know, like, like a fish to water. Just, it was, that was me. I loved goalkeeping. Because his season in England ended later, Tim is the last World Cup veteran of the team to arrive. For whatever reason, guys' schedules have them arriving on different days. But once the full team's together, it's, it's nice because then it feels like um, it feels like everything's complete and then you can move forward. Our team chemistry and our, and our togetherness, our willingness to work for one another has always been a staple of this team. And it's one thing we can never lose. And I think that's why it's so important that as we integrate new players into the squad, everyone has that understanding. Because if we go out on the field and we don't have that first and foremost, then um, we're already behind the eight ball a little bit. Lunch at one? Uh, Let me get changed. I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Hey, Tim, can I get a photo of you with yeah, that? Yeah, sure can. Thank you. You're my favorite. Oh, am I? Yeah. <laughs> How'd that happen? But thanks. Can I get a selfie? Sure can. Thank you. Just make sure. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, good, good, good luck, luck Jimmy. Good luck, Great job. Every single Thank time. Thank you, you play, Dad. Buddy. I appreciate it. All right, Thank good you. luck. All right, next Goalkeeping is very much an instinctual position. If you think a striker is going to go one way and you give him the other way, he's going to take it the other way. So it's not as easy as um, game planning. It's it's very much instinctual, and, and there's always a psychological edge. You know, um, anytime you can make a save on a player once or twice, then you start to look larger in the goal, and the goal starts to look a little bit smaller to them. I'm very much a yeller. That's all I do. The good players will tell you it's so important when your goalkeeper uh, speaks to you and tells you where guys are, because you know they don't have eyes in the back of their head. You know, that's what you're there to give them support, not only to save shots, but also to you know, make their job easier by letting them know where the pressure's coming from. You know, when it comes to a back line, a back four, it's very helpful. You have a call here in like 10 minutes, right? With your other yeah. coaches? Or do you just want to go do a quick run through really fast? Oh, yeah. Whatever you okay, want. We're done in three minutes. OK, yeah, cool. Can... We've sent some of these pants yeah, to I you have... before. I have... So... I have this one. OK. I have this one. Have, have you had the gray yet? Into... No, so this okay. one I don't. OK. Uh, Polo is self-explanatory. Yeah. No need for me with red. So, so uh, the same goes, uh, Pete, for shoes. No red shoes. No red shoes for me. So any red shoes off, the red polo too. 
Yeah. Done. So I would wear those ones. Or these ones. And these ones too, yeah. But that's it, really. Like I said, I just wanted to get you squared away and actually physically see the samples before yeah. you before Thank you wear you know, it. So, uh, thanks so much, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. Glad uh, you enjoy the stuff. In the early days of camp, Klinsman is trying to breed the contrasting values of team unity and individual competition. at camp, none feels more fortunate to be back than Maurice Adu. I grew up in a family of five um, to two Nigerian parents. And so naturally, you know, obviously in Africa in general, soccer is the most popular sport. So my parents were both in love with the game, my father especially. And he introduced me to the game at a very young age. And, you know, naturally I fell in love with it. And I used to always, you know, watch games on TV with my dad, and most of the soccer I saw was, was in Europe. So that's naturally what I dreamt of doing. I dreamt of playing in Europe. Adu's European dream came true in 2008 when he joined the Scottish Premier League powerhouse Glasgow Rangers. Then, playing for the United States in the 2010 World Cup, he came within a controversial whistle of scoring a goal that would have made him a World Cup hero. And he's into the back of the net. The goal is going to be disallowed. It won't come. Adu, 14 scored a winner for the USA. Returning to Rangers, everything began to go downhill, and Adu came face to face with the ugly side of European soccer. It was a Champions League game at home. I think we ended up losing by a large margin, maybe three or four nil. And obviously, everyone's upset. The players are upset, the fans are upset. So the game ends, and I'm just walking out to go to my car. You know, fans are there, obviously upset, saying different things or whatnot. And then as I approach my car, I just literally open my door, and then there's like a fence behind where we park our cars. And one of the fans shouts something. And for me, I was just kind of, I was in shock. I was kind of like, like looked around, like, is that to me, you know? And I didn't know how to react. I kind of just like stared at him and, and then he walked off and I just kind of sat there for a minute and didn't really know how to take it. It was a racial slur that Adu refuses to repeat to this day. I didn't really tell anyone about it. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my teammates. I kind of just slept on it. And then the next morning, again, I was still just thinking about it. And then on my way to training, I kind of like I tweeted something. I'm not sure what hurt more, the loss or, you know, to be racially abused by your own fans. Later, Adu would transfer to Stoke, where he played a grand total of 11 minutes in an entire season. So many times where I just kind of, I didn't even feel like me. You kind of lose your, you, sometimes you can even lose your appetite for the game, which is the worst. It's, I feel terrible even saying that. Literally adding injury to insult, a hernia caused Adu to miss World Cup qualifying and the Gold Cup with the national team. The whole summer I'm spent on the couch watching, watching the qualifiers, then eventually watching the Gold Cup. Latoya. Donovan! Big save! And the Americans take the lead! Every international game that happened that I wasn't a part of, I want to just jump into the TV and be a part of it. You, you watch the games and you're like, you know, time's ticking away. The World Cup's getting closer and closer. 
Whenever Jurgen speaks, you know, the emphasis is that you need to be playing. You need to be playing with your team, and that wasn't the case for me. Hungry for playing time, Adu engineered a move back home to MLS in 2014 to play with the Philadelphia Union in a final attempt to keep his World Cup chances alive. It's the left foot of Maidana. I was excited getting into camp, obviously. You know, you got to make Klinsman's decision as hard as possible. Everyone knows that there's going to be one more cut. So if you come out of a training session and you've not given your all, you've not left it all on the pitch, you're selling yourself short. So there's going to be tackles flying. There's going to be arguments. There's going to be guys fighting. And you need that. You need that. You, you need to see that hunger. You need to see that, that commitment by everyone to really wanted to be a part of this group. They will give absolutely 100% in whatever they're going to do now the next couple of weeks, you know. And then it, it is down to, to soccer-specific decisions, character decisions. But they are up to that competition. I think none of these guys now into camp will hold back. Four years of hard work, of sacrifice, not being scared by that, not being um, in awe of, of the moment, but just being ready to, to step on the field and, and give it everything and really, really go for it. This is the fun part because the World Cup is, is a few weeks away. At six feet five inches, Omar Gonzalez is the tallest player in camp. As a central defender, he has the potential to be the anchor of America's back line in Brazil. This is every young footballer's dream to, to represent your national team on a world stage and, and to play in a World Cup. For me, this is one of the last steps to becoming one of the final men on that 23-man roster. It's going to be tough knowing that, you know, seven, seven guys have to go home. But, but uh, for right now, I think we all just have to put that aside and really uh, try and help each other out and work towards one goal. And a spell this now for LA. Juninho hanging it up there. Gonzalez! The equalizer! Omar is a former MLS Rookie of the Year, Defender of the Year, and three-time All-Star. He made his debut for the national team after the last World Cup, justifying his selection by helping shut out Mexico at the Azteca during qualifying. In recent months, increased expectations have grown heavier on his shoulders. You could have driven a truck through the hole in the defense there. This game recently against Mexico, it was my first international game of the year. We just started our season, so of, of course I'm getting back into the swing of things. Those plays that happen, it happens fast, and, and so you move on. You recognize that mistakes were made, and you try not to make those mistakes again, and that's all you can do. I talked to Jurgen before the camp, and he definitely challenged me. He said, you know, you aren't where you were last summer. And so I'm really challenging you right now to get to that point again, because we're going to need you. And so, you know, before this camp, I, I really hit it in on, you know, started firing all cylinders to get ready for this camp. And, and, and then this injury happens. I tweaked my knee last week against Colorado Rapids. When this injury happened, 
I couldn't walk straight into the locker room. I had to, I had to take a walk because uh, all these emotions were, were, were going through my mind. I, I thought right away, man, I'm not going to be able to go to camp next week. Uh, it's, it's over. When you're injured and, and you're off to the side while everyone's busting their ass playing on the field, you know, it definitely makes me a little bit worried because I know that pretty soon the coach is going to be asking, how am I feeling? Everyone starts asking you, how are you feeling? And, and you just got to say, I'm doing great. No matter what you're feeling, you can never say, oh, I'm, I'm hurting here, I'm, I'm hurting there. No, because you want to be out there. I don't think that I'm going to be able to practice until next week, so I'm already going to fall behind a few days of, of training. For an injury to come around and, and knock you out of the selection, it's uh, a bit tough, but I'm not knocked out yet. And I just got to stay focused on getting healthy, and once I'm back on the field, I really have to hit it hard and, and uh, you know, hit, hit the ground running. All right, I want your thumbs at the top of your hairline. Elbows off the ground, knees off the ground, lock everything in and push up when you're ready. Then down. All these numbers and, and the data helps us a bit to have a consistent picture of the players. God forbid somebody gets injured or whatever, so the next one comes in. And then the next one after that, you know, has to cover it. But at the end, maybe you have a 50-50 situation. Then you go with uh, what you feel is right, you know, because at the end of the day, you are responsible for the outcome. I'm not uh, counting too much on numbers. I'm not a, a number guy, I'm not a statistic guy. It helps us underlying certain things, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the view you have as a coach um, that, that makes, uh, hopefully, the right decisions. Three, six, nine, 12. Why the hell did I get two or left arm up? Six, 18. Did you get what? 19. 18? What'd you get? I got a 19 last time I got it. 18? 18. What'd you get? 19. <laughs> Every sport has its different levels of benchmarking, and then soccer is no different. And the World Cup is the highest stage of where you can identify yourself, where you can see yourself with the best players in the world that you have to work yourself always to the very top. And once you are at the very top, which none of our players is, by the way, based on all that stuff we see, yeah, we're going to cut it down to 23. You know, we have to make the cuts of seven players. For more inside information, go to ESPNFC.com.